Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Spring Course Preview. I'm Sparrow Alden, and I'm so delighted to introduce my colleagues here at Signum University, who will be teaching in the spring term, which begins January 9th. The word spring is sort of a hopeful suggestion. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you all for, for testing the chat function this morning and making sure you know how to use it. Uh, we will prefer to take questions in the chat instead of through the question and answer box because it is easier for me to see. That's, that's just how that works. If I may introduce my wonderful friends, I'll do a round of introductions and then begin the questions. Sarah Brown and her colleague, Chris Vaccaro, um, um, Dr. Brown is in Wales. Dr. Vaccaro is in Vermont in the USA. They're going to be teaching the very first run of Race, Gender, and the Other in Tolkien. And we're very excited for this. It's going to be a live course, which means that the lectures will happen live with these amazing professors and They'll be recorded. If you can't be present for the lecture, you can watch them afterwards, but they will be taking questions in real time. And then there will be a discussion group to process all of this information and bind it up to the meeting. Uh, I would also like you to meet Dr. Liam Daly, who is teaching Chaucer One this term. Uh, Chaucer One is a flex course. The lectures are pre-recorded. Uh, exclusively. So watch them entirely on your own schedule and then meet once a week with Dr. Daly to talk about what happened in the text, what happened in the lecture. It's a lot of fun. Um, Nelson Gehring, Dr. Gehring is in Europe. Dr. Gehring, where are you actually? So your time zone is always intriguing. Belgium currently. Belgium. Belgium. Thank you very much. Dr. Gehring is uh, is one of the two teachers who's going to be leading um, Introduction to Germanic Philology 2. Does that sound like fun? Actually, it sounds like an absolute ton of fun. Um, and this course has yet another structure, which is there are pre-recorded lectures. There are weekly homework pieces, and then the sessions meeting with the preceptors are longer, about two hours a week, and they're work sessions where people are working on their translations. <laughs> yes, Takako, lucky you, there's homework. And finally, Dr. Gabriel Schenk, who is joining us from Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom, uh, who is along with Dr. Brown, precepting the Gothic tradition course with some marvelous old works and some marvelous new works. And I just cannot tell you guys how excited I am that these, that the faculty lined up this way, this term, their, their faces you know, unless you are brand new. So welcome to Signum University, if that's you. I'd like to start by talking with Sarah Brown. I know you've got a little bit of a sore throat today, but I'll, so I'll try not to text you too hard. How did you and Dr. Vaccaro come up with the idea to do race, gender, and the other in Tolkien? Well, uh, first of all, um, Chris Vaccaro is very sorry he can't be here for this recording. Alas, he's actually at his day job teaching at University of Vermont right now, uh, as we speak, in fact, otherwise he would be here. Um, but we came up with this idea because we have those interests in Tolkien. Um, I do a lot of my research and reading in Tolkien through uh, gender and feminist criticism. Uh, and Chris Vaccaro has written extensively on queer readings of Tolkien. And what we wanted to do was offer some new, different, challenging perspectives on Tolkien's work. Um, and this is what we came up with uh, because we wanted something that was really different um, and something that would um, 
it, it would bring in some of the really up to date right now conversations about Tolkien. And we just thought that was important. So that's how we came up with it. Um, and then having come up with the idea, we realized we'd have to write it. And we decided we would do that totally collaboratively. So a couple of times a week, he and I Zoom and we write our lectures together as if we're sitting in the same room. And it has been so lovely to work like that. And something I'm really looking forward to, and this is very, very new for Signum, is that in every single lecture, both of us will be there. This is true team teaching. Um, where each lecture uh, has been broken down into various chapters from the Lord of the Rings, and there will be some topics that he will lead on, some that I will lead on, and some that will be in conversation with each other. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's <laughs> that's going to be a lot of fun. I, that sounds like a wonderful model for preparing this course. So the question that leaps immediately to mind, both you and Dr. Vaccaro have different experience, different expertise, and you mentioned sometimes you'll be in conversation. Does that mean that sometimes you're bringing very different ideas to the same piece of text? Yes, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes um, I might be examining the text through um, a gender perspective and he's examining the same piece of text through a queer perspective. Uh, but also we'll be looking at it through the lens of race as well. Um, and to that end, because obviously we're two white folks talking about race, we have actually drawn on outside knowledge for us to, um, you know, offer as, as much of an authentic voice about race as possible. Um, and including some outside voices that I'm delighted to say, uh, one of um, the Signum students currently finishing up his thesis with us, um, Joe Nagar, is going to give a paper partway through the text uh, addressing race specifically and I'm absolutely delighted about that uh, and another one that um, we're going to have is Mercury Natus who is they're going to come in and give a talk on um, dwarves the Jewish diaspora um, being Jewish themselves that's something that the, they wanted to talk about and they're also going to address orientalism along with the squint-eyed southerner so um, we're hoping to bring as many different perspectives to the text as possible um, and you're right sometimes it's not the perspectives will clash it's just that we'll examine the intersection between those perspectives which I think will bring a, a new level of interest to a text that most of us are incredibly familiar with. Fantastic. And Joe is in the audience today and it says he is, he is very much looking forward to it. I, I'm really and, looking forward to what he's going to do because I know just how great Joe is at presenting his work. So it's going to be absolutely awesome for the students. It really is. Um, so there's an unanswerable question. Why are we having such good courses at the same time every semester. Sorry, Takako, all our courses are great. That's just how it works. Yeah, you don't <laughs> need sleep, Takako. Come on. <coughs> very, very true. And thank you for already registering, Diane. This is me taking a moment to, to plug register early because the scheduler is much, much happier when you do that. Um, and you have a better chance of getting into the section that is timed well for you. Uh, Professor Brown, have you settled on when the live course will actually happen? This is an easy one because the answer is, is it firmed up now? It is firmed up now. Um, and I saw Matty's uh, question come into the chat there. Um, apparently, it is going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. Fantastic. Now, the preceptor sessions have not been locked down in terms of time yet, and the preceptor sessions will be led by Chris Vaccaro for those who need US specific times that I can't do, and will be me for other people who have got, oh, sorry, Takako, 5 a.m. 
um, and me for uh, those who are slightly more flexible. So there'll be plenty of coverage for whatever times people need for their preceptor sessions. Fantastic. And as we all know, Takako doesn't sleep anyway. <laughs> no, no, I have seen Takako at what is absolutely the crack of dawn for her. Um, still there in classes, giving it everything. Takako is, I think we can agree, pretty dashed amazing. And that is a perfect lead in to my popcorn question for between course discussions. And I did not mean to cut you off, Dr. Brown, but I want to save your voice a little bit. So if, if there's more for us to know, uh, like give me the moose gesture. But I, I want to say that Takako has this huge enthusiasm and we hear how much Professor Brown appreciates her willingness to be there. So the question is, what as a as professors, what student traits do you admire, love to see? What gets you fired up to teach when you see it in your students? And Liam Daly, how about you? Oh boy, um, I mean, of course, I love it when they ask questions in class. I love it when they come prepared with you know something to to say, an opinion. I love it when they seek me out in my office hours to say, hey, I want to follow up with you about a specific thing. I think that's wonderful. Like, I'm doing this because I love it. And if you're interested in it as well, that makes me really happy. Fantastic. Okay, Nelson Goering, how about you? What student traits do you admire? Uh, I really like when I get asked questions I can't answer. Ooh. Uh, that's uh, and... is, if you think you can, if, 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 it just makes for the best discussions and, and takes us interesting places. Good. And I, I must say that modeling, I don't know, let's find out, is the most fun kind of teaching there is. Exactly. Right? It's a great, we, can, we get to learn something collectively and collaboratively. And that's, that's always fun. That is always fun. Fantastic. And Dr. Shank, how about you? What are some student traits that energize you for teaching? Well, I, I agree with the previous two points, um, but another trait that I really like uh, is when students rip uh, a text to shreds or uh, an author and say, I hate this author, or oh, this author is all wrong, or this text is garbage, or whatever, as long as they can explain why. Uh, and they can engage with the text. I love that. I, you know, it always amuses me. Um, of course, if you love the text, I love the texts that I teach. Um, but I, I, you know, that's great. But sometimes it's a way to real insights when you go in very critically. Uh, and then you can rip something to shreds. You can say this is hot garbage. And then you can say at the end, I actually really enjoyed it as well. So it's not it's not one thing or the other. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for addressing that popcorn question. I'm going to move on. And Dr. Shank, would you be willing to advance the slide to ask questions about Chaucer 1 with Dr. Liam Daly? Dr. Daly, where are you broadcasting from today? I'm from my apartment here in Washington, D.C. Very cool. Thank you. Okay. okay. You are this term, the preceptor precepting professor for Chaucer 1. Corey Olson is listed as the lecturing professor on the web page for the course. And oh friends, I'm going to be I'm going to put the web pages for these courses in the chat as well. Would you explain the difference between a precepting professor and a lecturing professor? Certainly, yes. So the lecturing professor delivers the, you know, two two 90 minute lectures a week on the on the content of the course so in this case that's uh professor olson who as i'm sure many of you already know before he became the tolkien professor uh earned his degree in medieval literature at columbia he was a tenure track medieval lit professor um so he he is an expert in in chaucer and the literature of the 14th century as much as he is an expert in tolkien um, so he'll be giving these two 90 minute lectures. That's the, you know, him lecturing. Yeah. Then okay. as preceptor, I meet with the students once a week. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really between me and them, the direction that the course goes in a way, because we talk about what it is that they are responding to in the lectures that we want to talk about. I work with them on their 
uh, research projects, helping them take that from like initial idea to working through the course of the research to a finished piece of writing. Um, I also do add an embellish <laughs> a little bit. So um, these lectures were recorded at a time when we didn't have to have secondary criticism at Signum University. So I'm adding all the secondary criticism because read literary criticism. We can't expect you to write it if you're not also given the opportunity to read it. So that is what a preceptor does. Fantastic. Okay, and this is labeled as Chaucer 1. Yes. I know that next fall we're planning to give Chaucer 2. Mm -hmm. Why are there two Chaucer courses? What's the difference? And is one simply the prerequisite for the other one? Oh, no, no, no. You take one. You can take one or the other or either in, in any order. One is not the prerequisite for two. Um, part two is the Canterbury Tales. And of course, like we all know the Canterbury Tales, we all know that Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. But the reason that this, um, the reason that there are two Chaucers is because I think Corey was frustrated with the way that he is often taught in academia, where people only read the Canterbury Tales, and he has this whole huge other body of work which is just as good, if not better, in parts than the one thing he's really, really known for that everyone reads. So here's a chance: this major author, this pivotal medieval author, let's. Let's do all of his other stuff, which is just as good, but not as not read as often. Okay, so mm -hmm. so Chaucer was writing in the thirteen hundreds. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that's right. Not, he was not writing in modern English as no. we speak and read it. Correct. Can you tell us about the language he was writing in and how you deal with that in this course? Sure. Yes. Um, so he's he's his English is Middle English. Um, okay. It's specifically London Middle English. Um, so it is it is the Middle English that eventually became the English that we speak in modern English. Um, yeah, someone's in the question. Is Middle English difficult? Asking for a friend. I I'm sure it it presents challenges. However. There is a lot of scaffolding and a lot of um, infrastructure in the class. The class is not taught with the expectation that anyone coming into this class can already meet, read Middle English. We go very slowly. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of training that goes into the the class, and I think it's one. Of, I mean, you you pick it up pretty quickly. Like once once you kind of get the hang over it, there's like an initial like sort of once you get over the hump, then you're then you're pretty good and you can just add to that knowledge with continuing grammar and continuing vocab. But it's challenging, but people pick it up pretty quickly. Interesting. So mm -hmm. the the text is in Middle English. Yes, I should. Right. Yes, we are reading <laughs> okay, it in Middle just, English. We're reading it in Middle English. Mm -hmm. um, um, but Dr. Olson and you are speaking modern English. Oh, yes. The lectures the and the discussions. Students are writing yes. modern Okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay. It is not right. a language course, but the reading might slow people down as they get those helps and that scaffolding and mm -hmm. the, the coaching that you provide and that I know comes in um, that marvelous first lecture that, that Corey Olson did. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, uh, Joe says, as a newcomer to Middle English, I can confirm the class is a great introduction. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, what else do I want to know about Chaucer 1? Oh, oh, how do you and Dr. Olson through the lectures structure this content? Is there a, this is, it's, it's works that we might not have heard of yet. Is there a pattern? Is there structure? Uh, how do you pull this course together? Sure, yeah. So the first part of the course, there's basically two parts. The first part, um, the, the title of the course, Visions of Love. The first part of the course is um, Chaucer's Dream Vision Poetry. It's not really a genre that exists anymore, but it is one of the major medieval genres. And it's basically, hello, I'm the narrator. I fell asleep. I had a dream. Here's my dream. And it's, you know, it's... It's a way to write about things that you couldn't have happen in real life. In some ways, it's kind of like an early form of science fiction. I think that's not too much of a stretch to say, 
you know, like I've always wondered where sound came from. Well, I had a dream that I went and I found the origin of sound and sound comes from a big wicker house that turns on a mechanism and it's in outer space. And it, you know, like it's, it's very I'm... surreal kind of poems. Um, it's also a way to talk about uh, medieval psychology. We talk about early dream theory, like where dreams come from and what medieval people understood dream, like what they meant, the different types of dreams you can have. Um, and the second half of the class, we're reading um, Chaucer's great novel length poem, the, the longest complete work that he ever wrote, uh, Troilus and Crusade. Uh, it's a love tragedy. And I, what I really like about that, it's a way to, yep, there it is. There it is indeed. Yes. Um, I mean, it's a way for us. I, what I like about it in the way that this class is, it's um, a way to talk about how a single very popular story changes over time. So we're reading uh, Chaucer's source, Boccaccio. We're reading then Chaucer's version. We talk a little bit about Shakespeare's uh, rewrite later once Chaucer had become canonical. Um, there's also a lot of, I, Chaucer was very into Boethian philosophy at the time, so it is a love tragedy, but there's also a lot of like, what is man's place in the universe kind of questions that get invoked there. Um, and reading that, we're also reading his follow-up piece, The Legend of Good Women, um, which is satire, legend being um, saint's life, basically, the, like the genre, the, the, the le you know, legend being, yeah, the life of a saint, like the recognized literary genre so like historical examples of heroic women which really ended up being historical examples of terrible men but it's kind of he's doing some gender satire it's um i i guess i should also mention most of the stuff we're reading is also really funny <laughs> is another thing it's really funny yeah um so i'm writing that's down... what we're reading in the chaucer class i'm writing down historical examples of terrible men and i yes. will yes that's mm -hmm. okay yeah that's a keeper i'm excited for this class now. <laughs> <laughs> would not okay. have been as catchy a title as the legend of good women but yeah. <laughs> um okay excellent so is there anything in preparing for this course, which which you have been preceptor for at least three times now? Is that correct? Yeah, I think this is my three or first four. Yeah, I it's think it's your 2014, 2017, 2020, because it this oh, is an wow. every three years. Mm -hmm. This is your fourth time leading Gosh. people through this course. Is there anything you're reading fresh in preparation for it? New stuff. Yes. Yeah, so I will be. Uh, I will be taking a fresh look at some of the lit crit that has uh, come out since the last time I taught it. Okay. Um, and I'll probably, I don't know how much I'll read enough over it in advance. I will certainly be reviewing the basics of Middle English because even though you know, I learned Middle English from Corey Olson you know, 15, 20 years ago, I still need to brush up on it a bit every time. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll be doing to prep to prepare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you reading anything for fun? Um, yeah, just worked my way through some uh, Sherlock Holmes that I had never read before. Oh, delicious. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's our next popcorn question. Dr. Brown, are you reading anything for fun right now? And what is it? Um, actually, I am. I'm reading one of my favorite new authors, uh, T.J. Klune, uh, and I'm reading Under the Whispering Door which is absolutely stunning, but then his work really is. Um, it's, it's about death, but in a really beautiful way. Um, and it's very typically Clune-esque in that it's, it's kind of fantastical a little bit, but uh, I, if you haven't read any TJ Clune, I really heartily, heartily recommend his work. Um, and I'm about three quarters of the way through Under the Whispering Door, but it is my second read through. Uh, because I adore his work, uh, oh. and uh, I, I just think it's one that everybody should read, along with everything else he's ever written, frankly. Fantastic. Um, um, and Professor Daly, Professor Brown, would you both be willing to put in the chat the title of exactly what you're reading now? In oh, case right people now. need to read more between now and the start of term, while I 
ask Dr. Goering, what have you been reading for fun? Uh, I'm in the early portions of um, uh, The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut by uh, David Mitchell, um, which is, uh, he's a, it's a, the Cloud Atlas is maybe his more famous book. Uh, I read that, I liked it, so I'm now reading more by him. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of things going on with the Dutch trading colony in um, uh, Japan was in the period where the Dutch had like exclusive rights in this little cramped little colony here and everyone's in there and kind of being nasty to each other, <laughs> things like that. Uh, but he makes it kind of entertaining and funny and uh, things like that. Yes, I, I'm only yes. 50 pages in, so I have a long ways to go. Excellent, excellent. And if you'd be willing to throw that in the chat as well, fantastic. Um, because, because, because it is your book flood season, my people. Yes, it is. <laughs> Finally, Professor Schenk, have you been reading anything for fun lately? Yes. Um, the current book I've got on the go is um, <coughs> a graphic novel set in the Sandman universe. Oh. Sandman um, was written, created by Neil Gaiman, who is one of the writers on the Gothic tradition course. And this is um, a kind of extended universe uh, series of stories. So it actually takes place after the main Sandman story, okay. um, which is really interesting. If you've got to the end of that story, I won't spoil it, but it, it's, you know, interesting to see that picked up. Um, and um, these stories are written by G. Willow Wilson, who um, wrote the novel Alif the Unseen, which is a fantastic novel that I read um, a while ago, um, actually for uh, for Signum. For, uh, I had a student, Mark, who was uh, doing his thesis on magical magician hackers and that was one of his key novels so um you do read some fantastic novels uh, as a teacher at signum university you get to discover new works um which i'm very grateful for uh i'm also reading caroline alexander's um translation of the iliad um and i quite recently finished madeline miller's uh, song of achilles which is based on the iliad uh, and the love between uh, patroclus and achilles and that was um devastatingly beautiful Oh my, that sounds wonderful. And would you also be willing to put titles and authors in the chat Sorry. for us? All righty. Um, so back to Nelson Goering in Belgium. You are the preceptor, depending on how many enrollments, maybe one of two preceptors for Germanic philology too. What's philology? <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> philology is one of these words that's really kind of hard to describe in a nutshell, but basically what we are doing is we're looking at um, uh, texts in earlier Germanic languages and then understanding the, the, the context that they, that they were in. Um, so it's sort of partly linguistic, partly cultural, partly historical, partly literary, kind of all, 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 all tied together through the, through the texts them, themselves. Um, and it's a follow-on from Germanic philology one, where we sort of looked at all these early Germanic languages, and then now we're sort of taking a step back and looking at those contexts a little more. Uh, and there's going to basically be like a cultural side of things and a and a language side of things, basically. So the cultural okay. side of things will will spend lectures on things like um, uh, Norse pre-Christian religion, and then Christianity, the different forms of Christianity in various um, uh, that were adopted by speakers of these various languages or their laws, or the development of the Nibelungen legends, um, or things like that. Um, and then on the language side, we'll also kind of take a step back and look at context for these languages, um, including things like the relationship. These, these, these early Germanic languages are things like Old English and Old Norse and Old High German. Uh, and they're mostly kind of spoken in this little quarter of Europe, but they're part of a larger group of languages. So they're related to things like Latin and Greek and Welsh and Lithuanian and random things like that uh, that you might not expect. So we'll we'll take a step back. We're not going to like look at you know you don't need to know Welsh or Lithuanian or anything like that. you know you know that's not that's not the point. We're looking a little bit at how how these things kind of fit together into this larger jigsaw of um, of, of language. How very cool. Okay, all of those sound like neat concepts, but. If if someone were trying to picture themselves in your course, what is a normal week for a philology student in one of your classes? 
Um, am, am I reading? Am I? What am I doing? There's there so there well there's there's going to be some background reading and uh, that will that will be go along with the lecture that will you know they they will introduce one of these topics. There'll be a lecture on okay. law. There'll be a lecture on dragons. There'll be a lecture on dragon slaying poems. <laughs> uh, that doesn't get you. I don't know what will. Um, um, and uh, uh, and then the preceptor sessions we will uh, sort of divide between unpacking things from the lectures and then always there will be a focus text, uh, which will be a small little text in one of these languages. And you don't need to know the languages ahead of time because we'll provide all the materials you need to know. We're doing really short little extracts, right? Uh, okay. to, but to unpack and understand what's going on uh, uh, through the lens, because really it is, the philology is always through, through text. So we need to make sure we're always looking a little bit at, at the text and don't lose sight of, of that grounding. Okay. Okay, love it. Uh, a good question has come up in the chat, and that is, does one need to take the two in order? We know that Chaucer 1 and Chaucer 2 are not dependent on each other. They're just different pieces of Chaucer's work. Um, what do you recommend to your students for the Germanic philology 1 and 2? Uh, so formally, Germanic philology 1 is a prerequisite for Germanic philology 2, and it does okay. kind of presuppose Again, not needing to fully know all the, you know, but, but having some, some idea of the background is, is I think important because there'll be things we're sort of taking for granted in course two that, uh, you know, that got explained in course one to an extent. But that said, I think if you've got any independent background or interest in any of these subjects, you probably have enough of a background to jump into two. Uh, so if, you, if, you, if you're interested, just email me or uh, one of the other uh, people involved, and we'll see whether you kind of meet the. Uh, we think you you know you've got enough background, and, and the answer is if you're interested enough. I'm guessing the answer is yes. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, just uh, so it's 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 a formal prerequisite, but a, but a slightly flexible. Okay, fantastic. Um, uh, another question has rolled in for you in the philology two course. Will you? look at how critical editions are produced methodologically what if someone sees themselves as someday i want to i want to do this with texts that haven't been treated in such a way will we learn we the students <laughs> learn how to do that or at least what it looks like uh, well, that's a topic very, very near and dear to my own heart. Um, oh. Uh, oh. We won't, we don't have, I think, a dedicated lecture on that subject. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but it's something that can very easily, so when we're looking at the little snippets of text, it's something I am more than happy to go into at any point. Um, okay. And uh, again, one of these things, one of the nice things about using a text as a focus in this way is that it allows us to explore, you know, different directions. So if someone is interested in the editing, how these texts, you know, comes from came from the manuscript to, you know, something we can actually uh, edit on the page. Um, uh, that's something we can, we, can, we can go into very much, um, uh, depending, on, depending on student interest and-, and uh, Fantastic. Yeah. And I think that's one of the strengths of Signum's small class size. If a, if a student comes in thinking about being a critical edition editor, then that's what they bring to the table. They can ask, the class can adapt. Someone comes in really interested in uh, history and culture and how people and language transmitted these stories, then they can bring that question to the table. And that's just a very exciting thing for me. Yes, our to be read piles just got much larger. You know what, lucky us, right? Okay, is there anything else that the Germanic philology folks wanted me to be sure to ask? Oh, I, I, I got in. What the heck is philology? That's good. Alrighty. I'm going to ask a different kind of popcorn question than I have asked before. And because we know you as professors, is there anything about yourself as a student that you would like people to know. Um, um, then, and Nelson, you go right ahead. When are you, do you still consider yourself a student? When you were a younger student or maybe at the level that your MA students are, 
was there something about your method that you want to pass on or a mistake that you made that you want to warn people away from? Um, uh, maybe a mistake I made that, 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 that can be an encouragement rather than a warning. Um, I, I, I'm maybe not the best role model as a student. <laughs> uh, I, I, I worked last minute and had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I only kind of figured out kind of what I wanted to do the, my lap, very, very end of my undergraduate uh, time. Basically, um, but I think you know it all works out. Uh, even if even if it even if you're taking things, it's all it's all useful. Everything everything's interesting. Everything's worthwhile. Uh, I really did meander my way through my undergraduate degree, and I don't really regret it. I, I think it's been, uh, I, I think the, the the scenic route was 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 worthwhile. Uh, in the Fantastic. Okay, uh, Liam Daly, how about you? When you were a student. When I was a student, I mean, I was a student relatively recently because I just uh, finished my doctorate in May. So yes, I will still accept applause for that six months later. Um, gosh, what, do you know, I, it took me four years to write my dissertation and a lot of little deadlines and a lot of big deadlines and other than the final deadline to submit it in the course of four years, I didn't make a single deadline not one not one <laughs> deadline in four years did i make um my advisor was very patient with me <laughs> i hope to pay that forward uh yeah i'm very bad with deadlines i learned that about myself as a student okay okay so learn but what was the title of your thesis please oh uh staging the middle ages oh god what was the second title Hang on. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The subtitle kept changing so many times. Oh, okay. Staging the Middle Ages, History and Form in Early Modern English Drama. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Second titles are just sort of take me down rabbit holes. <laughs> so I won't, I won't follow that yet, but maybe we'll have a chat about medieval drama at some point. That would be Anyone fun. is welcome to look me up to chat about that. I'm very happy. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Dr. Brown, how about you? When you were a student, what was part of that experience that you want people to know? Okay. So um, I've been a student a lot because I've done far too many degrees as we all have who sitting here in this room. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I think I could best describe myself as a chaotic super procrastinator. Um, and it wasn't good. And I actually realized that it caused me so much stress because that's exactly how I was. I was just not great at sticking to deadlines and it was lastminute.com for everything. And I discovered it actually was not, not good for me at all. Um, so when I did my master's degree, which is uh, mumble mumble years ago now, um, I kind of, changed at that point um and became like ridiculously organized uh, and that served me really well when it came to my phd because when i was doing my phd um which i only finished in 2013 um i was bringing up a young family working full-time as a teacher running a boarding house of 22 boys with my husband and sleeping occasionally. Uh, and what I learned was that if I wasn't incredibly organized and very good at planning ahead, I got nothing done in the time that I had. So what I learned was to know when the time would be coming up for when I had PhD work time, and then to actually plan exactly what I intended to do in that time. And so when I sat down at my desk on that day with those hours, I knew that this was what I intended to achieve. And that is what I found to be the most useful piece of advice to give any of our students who are often juggling family commitments, work commitments, all sorts of commitments, is that when you know you've got some time that's set aside, plan ahead of time exactly what you hope to cover and achieve in that time. And you've got more chance of getting it done. So okay. Okay. I've kind of switched from chaotic all over the place to tunnel vision when it comes to my work. I wish that I could say that I was as equally organized with the minutia of my life these days. I don't always answer emails within 24 hours, alas. 
Um, I try to, uh, but I, when it comes to work things that I need to do, it's okay, plan, plan, plan. Uh, and I actually get much more stressed when the plan either doesn't get to be or needs to be changed or something like that. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And we're getting marvelous comments over in the chat about when one does a digital analysis of the words used in today's webinar. Probably our most commonly used word is sleep, mm -hmm. as in there none. isn't any, none, mm. there's, there's no sleep, there's no sleep. Finally, Professor Shank, how uh, well, about yourself as a student? I, I don't have to think that far back um, because I was a student quite recently in space, uh, the, uh, the Signum program for uh, adults continuing education. Uh, and I took a course in Owen Barfield um, which was excellent. And I'm hoping to take a course on uh, Japanese language uh, next year. Uh, and um, one thing that I realized about myself in that course is that I um, don't need to attend each session really understanding the text that we're going to be discussing, um, which is quite good for Barfield because he, he can be quite dense and complex. Um, but if you understand something maybe just 10 or 20 percent if you go into the classroom with three or four other students and a good preceptor which we had uh what will almost certainly happen is that together you combine to make 100 percent understanding the things that you notice and you understand are going to be different to the things that other people have noticed and understood and i was really in awe of my fellow students um that they they seemed so brilliant that they were seeing these things that I hadn't understood at all. Um, but then I was able to contribute my um, uh, halfpenny pieces or whatever the phrase is. Uh, and so it was really nice to to sort of remind remind myself of that uh, quality as a student, but also um, take that forward uh, in my own classrooms as a teacher, uh, and hopefully reassure my future students that you know, all you need to do is have read the text and come with something, one thing that you've noticed or understood, and we'll talk about it together. And by the end of the one hour discussion, you will understand so much more because you'll have heard um, other uh, uh, areas of expertise and they'll all fit together like a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. It's a fantastic. Um, if I may continue um, with you, Dr. Shank, you are one of the preceptors, and if there are enough students, Dr. Brown will be the other one. For the Gothic tradition, which is uh, very much a traditional literature course, um, and Amy Sturgis is the lecturer, yep. you're one of the preceptors, and the lectures have been pre-recorded people can watch it at their leisure so when people come to discussion with you or to the asynchronous discussion board with you um what kinds of questions are you and the group going to be asking of the literature what's what's in the gothic tradition to sink our teeth into so this is going to be my second time teaching this course. Um, I should preface this by saying I love all my children equally, but um, I, I might say that this is my favorite course uh, to teach at Signum, um, although, you know, there's stiff competition. Uh, it's a wonderful course. I, I'm you know, A great part of that is the reading list, is Dr. Sturgis's amazing lectures. Also, just I love things that go bump in the night, um, the uncanny, the sublime, um, crumbling gothic castles on the precipice of cliffs at midnight next to a crashing waterfall and in the middle of a big storm by the sea you know that that's kind of where thing. that's where you live isn't it that's where i live well that's where i would okay. love to live yeah if only okay. um so you know we'll be asking questions uh, about all those things but really the main question that i think this course is about is what is gothic um, this course is called the Gothic Tradition. It's not called the Gothic genre. It's not called Gothic texts. It's called the Gothic Tradition. And tradition is quite a broad term. Um, lots of things can fall into a, a tradition. Um, what makes something Gothic? Um, you might think you know the answer to that before you've taken the class, or you might not. And 
Dr. Sturgis does give a definition of the Gothic very early on, but we do such a wide range of texts, um, and not just texts, but um, TV shows, movies, comics, um, short stories. Uh, Dr. Sturgis even talks about Gothic songs and plays some songs at one point in one of the lectures. Uh, we do science fiction, we do historical, we do romance, we do fantasy. Um, what makes something Gothic? That's the question I, I want students to come back to again and again, um, because it's not, it's not necessarily uh, like a box ticking exercise. It's an atmosphere. It's a, it's a perspective. Uh, anything can be Gothic if you um, describe it in the right way. Uh, and um, that's a kind of wonderful thing. And it means that you can find magic wherever you are. Um, so that everything can become Gothic and, and just a little bit more exciting. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, you, Professor Schenk, and you, Professor Goering, to both unmute and to help us with what is the relationship between the Gothic tradition in literature and stories and the Gothic language, which are both courses that you can take at Signum. Do, do, you, do you want to have a go, Professor Gurren? <laughs> yeah, we, we actually open uh, our Gothic class, a Gothic language class with this sort of, you know, panorama of all the things Gothic can mean. Um, I'm not sure I know all of the links, but 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 the basically Gothic started out referring to this early Germanic speaking people over in Eastern Europe and then in Italy, and then kind of got used to mean anything sort of Germanic for a long time. Uh, so that's why you have Gothic architecture. This is basically a meant German architecture, more or less, and things like that. Um, and then that, you know, same for script. Um, and then somehow from there it made the leap to the literary label thing. I'm not quite sure how that happened. So, maybe so, you can... <laughs> okay, so pause, mm -hmm. Dr. Goering, what years were people speaking this language? Oh, very, way, way long ago. Um, so the, the text Give me a the number. Gothic were, were written maybe in the 300s. Uh, oh, and, uh, okay. And so, yeah, that's, that's many, many, many centuries ago. Okay, 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 great. And Dr. Schenk, how did the leap happen? We've, we've made it as far okay. as German architecture. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, you know, you have the language, the people, then the architecture gets named after those things. Um, the tr the literary, literary tradition gets named after the architecture. So something about Gothic architecture is that it seems unsettling um buttresses think about buttresses think about those big domes um i'm not an expert in architecture dr Sturges does talk about this in one of her lectures but one of the great innovations with gothic architecture is that you can have much taller buildings that seem um the ceilings seem as if they're just floating on air uh because of the way the buttresses work um so uh very thin sort of um uh, ribbons of stone holding up these enormous towers and these enormous ceilings just disappearing into the gloom. Um, there is something very beautiful about it and there is something unsettling about it as well. And that's very gothic, something that um, it seems familiar, but also unsettling. Something's just a little bit off about it. Something seems unnatural, impossible, um, familiar in some ways, but different as well. So fall of the house of Usher, it's a romance story, but it's also incest. It's a home, but it's also crumbling castle. So it's, it, you know, it's it's this, but it's that. And that's very much Gothic architecture. So that's why um, it lends itself to the literature. Uh, and then also there's this wonderful concept of the sublime, um, which Burke wrote about. Uh, the sublime is something that is vast and dangerous and mysterious. And that's Gothic architecture as well. It looks incredible, but it also looks like it might collapse at any point. And sometimes it does, because of course you get these wonderful Gothic um, ruins as well. So they all kind of like mixes together and becomes Gothic literature. The Hugo oh, play any role in that, do you think? Notre Dame de Paris? Yeah, d no, definitely as well. And, and Castle of Otranto, which um, is, is one of, is arguably the first Gothic 
text um Walpole that we read in the court course as well is set in a gothic castle in Italy um so very early on you know these writers were making a link between the feeling of gothic architecture and the feelings they were trying to capture in uh their writing but you don't have to be set you don't have the text doesn't have to be set in um, a gothic castle for it to be gothic um although you need you can have sort of some of the same feelings for example in a spaceship um it, something that is a bit dangerous something that is a bit unknowable something that is mysterious something that is um familiar but also unsettling uh, that's basically what gothic is Okay, kind of the architecture and the spaceship in Gideon. Exactly, exactly. Fantastic. Um, it, 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 we've got questions about your reading list, Professor Schenk. Um, I know that you wanted to talk about your reading list. And the first question is, will anything by Flannery O'Connor be included in the course? Uh, not this course. Um, oh, Dr. Brown just added that <laughs> yes. Dr. Sturgis is thinking about doing a new course on Southern Gothic. Um, I should say, <clears throat> and first of all, apologies that both myself and Dr. Brown are ill, although that seems quite appropriate as we're both Gothic tradition teachers and we are betwixt life and death, but um, much closer to life than death. We're both fine, I'm sure, but um, we're kind of wasting away in our isolation chambers um, very appropriately. And it is very foggy and dark in uh, the UK at the moment as well. Um, it, one of the uh, the students last time I taught this course collated all the, 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 the texts that Dr. Sturgis mentions in her lectures and came up with an enormously long list. I'm, I've am i heard that the same thing happened in Dark Academia, which is um, kind of Gothic adjacent, um, which is a course that Dr. Sturgis has finished teaching. So uh, I can't say for sure whether um, whether whether uh, Flannery O'Connor isn't mentioned in the course. Um, they, they might well be, but they're not one of the key authors. Uh, for the list of key authors, you can check out the website and you can find all those uh, wonderful authors and texts. Um, we really go back to the foundations of Gothic literature um, with Walpole. We do Anne Radcliffe. We do um, Charlotte Bronte, Daphne du Maurier. I mean, it's just such a fantastic list of authors. One thing to quickly mention as a kind of um, warning, maybe too strong a word, but um, just to... Uh, Bit of advice for students thinking about taking this course do look up uh the length of some of these novels there are some quite long novels in there um gothic texts do te tend to be chunky um, it is a very well thought out course in that uh if you we have one week which for example is uh radcliffe's the italian which is about 500 pages that's followed by short stories by ed Allan poe then we do another long story um jane eyre uh, then we do another few short stories. So you can kind of get rest weeks and you get weeks when you can read ahead to the next week. But if you're thinking about taking this course, it might be a good idea to get started on those chunky novels early. There's only about three that are really big and chunky. There's Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, there's The Italian by Anne Radcliffe. And then there's Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Um, all three are fairly quick reads, but they are long. So I just want to let you know about those. And then the rest of the texts are either kind of more common, you know, maybe 200 pages or so, or their short stories or their TV episodes or films. My goodness. These all sound like so much fun. And in fact, I've never taken any of these four. So, hmm, hmm. Remember, folks, you can be a discussion auditor, which means you get the lectures, you get uh, to be in the d weekly discussions, and you're not writing the papers, but you're also not earning credit. The Race, Gender, and the Other course has a premier audit option, which is to attend the lectures or to watch them in, um, in, in recorded format afterward. And that doesn't have the intimate group discussion, but it still does have access to the discussion board. So there are forms of auditing. If you want to know about the difference between all of these things, uh, write to info 
at signumu.org. And uh, uh, would one of you lovely professors put that in the chat so people have it if they need it. Um, as I ask our final question, out of respect for people's, some voices are fading and we love your voices. So I, I don't want to push us too long, but I'm going to start with Professor Daly. You are leading Chaucer one, but which of the others would you take if you had time and if you could? Oh boy. I mean, I'm very excited for the race, gender, and the other in Tolkien class. I think like that's I'm I I would be very, very curious to take that. Um, but also the Gothic tradition. Like half of that I've read, half of it I haven't. Yeah, I why I, I let's fill in those gaps. Okay, fantastic. How about you, Professor Goering? Uh, I mean, it would be a uh, a hard decision, <laughs> a very hard decision. Um, I think I'd probably have to go with uh, uh, the uh, race, gender, other than Tolkien um, uh, class. Just I think that's a really interesting angle on. I mean, I, I've been reading Tolkien's works for ages and ages and ages, and um, it's always great to go back to his materials and see how you can reread them through 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 ways that I'm not maybe as used to reading them or as used to seeing things. And I think that class would be an absolutely fantastic way to, to do that through many interesting perspectives and with a lot of interesting people. Oh, fantastic. Alrighty, Dr. Brown, um, uh, clearly you already have Liam Dale and Nelson Goering on your student list, but if you got to go and take one of their classes of, of, of Gothic tradition, philology, even even if you do not currently qualify for philology too, which I don't know if you do, or Chaucer, which one would you like to take? Well, you're right. I wouldn't qualify for philology too. Um, th this is such a tough question every single time because it's like asking someone to choose between you know their favorite children or their favorite drag queens or you know something like that i mean it's just no don't do this to me i mean i'm still hoping we get enough sign ups so that i can be the backup preceptor for uh, dr shank for yes. the gothic tradition because obviously he's he's primary preceptor but if we get enough students i can also do some of the classes which i really would love so you know sign up today um but i either uh, Nelson's or Liam's would really challenge me uh, and perhaps I might I might jump for uh, Dr Goering's class simply because I have never taken a language class at graduate level and I think it would really challenge the heck out of me so maybe maybe I would do that but it's so hard because I also like Chaucer so mm. and oh, I'm like Takako. So we've got so many good courses. Why do we have got, to choose? We've got so many good courses. We really do. And remember, my friends, we have once a course has run for the first time. So now for Chaucer one, Germanic philology two, and uh, the Gothic tradition, the lectures have been given and recorded and people who just want to enjoy the lectures read along at their own pace and not do it all in the 12 weeks with the accountability are called anytime auditors again write to info at signumu.org an anytime auditor gets access to those lectures and to an auditor discussion board and get yourself the books and enjoy it in the way that's best for you. And I am just saying that anytime audits fit in stockings, just for the record, they do. Okay, we've got what course you take. I would, honest to good uh, folks, I am among other things, a Signum alum. And I was, I was one of the, early students and the only language course that was available for me was the predecessor of the Germanic philology courses, which is called Philology Through Tolkien. And boy, it lit my heart on fire. So I would 
first choose to be ready to take Germanic philology too, and then jump right in there because wow, how much fun. I rem and Nelson Goering was my preceptor, and I remembered the day that we were translating something about dragons, and I managed to translate it was green and slimy. And I'm sold. I'm I'm there forever. So all right. My friend, thank you so much for coming in. Are there more questions? Oh, that's right. Takako reminds me that right now, for a few weeks, the Anytime Audits are on sale. They're only $75 instead of $95, just to prove the fact that they fit in stocking so beautifully. And of course, we've already also mentioned our space program, which is not for credit. It is... It's turning out to be pretty academic, but sometimes not academic. That is like mini courses, one month, fun things, right to info. And yeah, the space is incredible. If you want to, for example, learn Old Norse, but slowly without that 12 week intensity, you can do that through space and while you're taking your philology courses and not being able to choose between any of the courses and so taking them all and then once you graduate you can audit forever we are building among other things we're building a community and of people who love to learn this stuff and <laughs> sleep is a, why is a day only 24 hours is it true Takako, that in japan if you stay up for the day and it's midnight and you stay up you can call the hour 25 26 you've got a few extra hours but they're they're stolen from tomorrow is that is that a true thing oh that's it keep orbiting the globe fantastic so that you can gain on those time zones See what creative, wonderful people you are. Okay. Thank you for joining me. We are excited for your registration. And here's the word on scheduling. That is that our Knights Errant, our work-study students, are we're, we're waiting for that list to be finalized, and then they will get their work-study credits and be able to register for spring term. And we're not going to finalize anything until our amazing work study students have had chance to register. So everyone else register soon so that when I go and say, okay, our work study students have registered and I'm ready to make the schedule, everyone who's already there literally helps me plan when the preceptor sessions are. I take the preceptor availability and then everyone else's work schedule. And once we've locked it down, if you register at the last minute, good luck with, with being having it match your availability. So, and that's that. Let's see, thank you for attending and summer and fall and the space time continuum. Yes, everyone, we're looking forward. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Sparrow Alden. These are my extraordinary colleagues. Good morning to you.